I think part of what a degree in journalism is, is a degree in internet literacy. But I think we're all navigating internet literacy all the time because the internet is changing and becoming more extreme and more polarizing all the time. And it's counting on these big emotional reactions. So we really have to stay level headed and think, is this true before we share stuff? This is Podcast 96, Jayagone with Deep Six. A great day to all of you, and it's a pleasure to be with you right now. You know, I miss going to conventions so much that uh, on this episode, I specifically got this photo from Cosplay Mania a few years ago on the background. Before we start, I'm sure most of you probably know that I was part of an anime blog before, and during that time, I received a copy of a book from our guest for this episode. It's called Otaku Journalism, a guide to geek reporting in the digital age. And I have kept it in my Kindle ever since. You know, it's been almost 10 years since she started to write the book in 2012 as the new media guide for aspiring journalists and bloggers with geek inclinations. And after this, she wrote other books such as her second self-published book, Build Your Anime Blog and Cosplay, The Fantasy World of Roleplay, published by Carlton Books. She also co-founded the website Gunpla 101. Most importantly, our guest has stories published on Forbes, The Washington Post, The Anime News Network, Crunchyroll News, Anime Feminist, The Daily Dot, Read Write, among others. She's been doing this for more than a decade now. Otaku journalist Lauren Orsini joins us in this episode. Let's go! It's 9 a.m. Manila time, Thursday, October 28th, and 9 p.m. Eastern time, Wednesday, October 27th. So we have here our guest, Lauren Orsini, Otaku journalist. How are you? Uh, how are you feeling today? Hi, Jay. Thank you so much for having me on your podcast. I feel like uh, we met um, seven, eight years ago. Yeah, uh, online, online. When mm-hmm. I was, yeah, I was online, still doing my, uh, when I was still doing my uh, stint as uh, a team. Well, a team player or a team lead for a group blog. Uh, that th- those uh, that was a long time ago, and still, we're uh, it's 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 2021. We're still here, mm-hmm. alive and kicking. Yeah, still here, still talking, thinking about fandom all the time. Which yes, is- definitely. Uh, um, so, for starters, uh, while I'm much more inclined to virtual YouTubers, uh, what are your interests right now? Is it still anime? Is it still manga? Oh, it's absolutely still anime. It's just, even even now that I'm so busy with my two-year-old daughter, I still am finding time to watch like 10 shows this season. And I, and I believe uh, you're reviewing these series for ANN. I'm not reviewing anything for Anime News Network right now, but I am um, curating their weekly newsletter. So uh, Yes, yes. I, I stay really up to date on the news and really up to date on what all, all their weekly streamers are reviewing. Yes. And uh, yes, uh, since we mentioned the Anime News Network, the announcements newsletter, right? Uh, uh, yeah, you could sign up uh, for that so that you can get the latest. Uh, this is a weekly newsletter. Am I correct? That's right. It comes out every Sunday morning. Well, my time. So it would be evening your time. Yep. Uh, Monday evening, yeah. I think. <laughs> Most probably Monday uh, Monday morning. Yeah. Oh yeah, Monday. Well, if it comes out Sunday morning my time, Sunday night your time. Yeah, you know, time is just a concept. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. All right. Yeah, I would. I would. I'm so glad that we are promoting the Anime News Network newsletter before we even do anything else, because that is like the main professional pursuit that I've been doing right now, and I would really like if a lot more people read it. Yes, definitely. So yeah, uh, the uh, newsletters in the website. So there's a sign up form somewhere over there, or I can link it in the description later on. Um, awesome. Okay. All right. Uh, okay. So uh, moving on, uh, we had our previous email conversations before uh, this recording happened, and in the previous email, you mentioned that the book Otaku Journalism book is less. Uh, less relevant than it used to be. Uh, From your perspective, how soon were you able to make this conclusion? 
Well, if we count back to publication, this book is seven years old. I published it in March 2014, which means that my blog that it's based on, otakujournalist.com, is actually 12 years old this November, or the month that you're probably listening to this podcast. I launched the blog on November 14th, 2009. That's a long time. uh, Yeah, it's been a long time since I've written on the blog, too. I last posted in August about a panel that I ended up not giving because I backed out of Oticon from COVID scares. I mean, because my daughter's not vaccinated yet. Understandable. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, but the the book is super old and um, definitely less relevant. I mean, one thing that's really jarring from the book, like I just uh, opened it and went back and and read some parts of it when I knew I was going to go on this podcast. And one thing that's really jarring is I intersperse each of my chapters with a fictional story about a young otaku journalist. And um, each of these fictional people is like named after one of my real life friends. And one of them is dead now. Uh, She died in 2017. So it's really bittersweet to see her memorialized in the book. I'm, I am really glad I included her. It's just, I can't believe how, how long ago all this is. Yes. Uh, well, that, that actually is, was uh, surprising to me, uh, given that I've uh, seen enough uh, of uh, my, uh, well, I've, I've seen one of my co- uh, good friends, also a virtual YouTuber, who eventually passed away from, not COVID, uh, but from cancer. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah that, that does yeah. happen. The longer we stay in this fandom, uh, we say goodbye to people for all kinds of reasons. I mean, yes. a lot of people leave, like, after starting starting a family, they have less time. Uh, I'm clearly not one of those people. We've also um, seen people pass away. But also, that's not the only reason I can tell that this book, Otaku Journalism, is super old. Oh, and I just want to say to everyone who is listening to this that... Um, you can download this book for free um, from Amazon Kindle. I made it. Amazon does not want me to give away stuff for free, so they only let me do a five-day free promotion. But um, I set it to be a free promotion from uh, the day of the publication of this podcast for the following five days. And if you miss it by a little, you can just email me, and I will send you a .mobi or a .epub. Because whatever, this book is seven years old. If you want to read it, I, I'm grateful. <laughs> okay, so let's. Yeah. Now that I've like promoted it, I, I am going to talk about like some of its shortcomings. Like you asked, you asked like how could I make the conclusion that this is less relevant than it used to be? Yes. Well, I mean, first of all, <laughs> the examples I'm giving of my fan reporting are all super old. Like they're mostly from the Daily Dot, which is where I was actually um, working when I started writing the book. Uh, one article I shared is about the brand new Homestuck Phantom. <laughs> and and for that article, I interviewed just some guy named Toby Fox, who I just said, oh, yeah, he's a college student. He really likes Homestuck. And as you know, T- Toby Fox went on to create the game Undertale. Mm. But I just ran into him at a con and interviewed him as a regular guy. How time flies. Yeah, I know. Things change. And Okay, so just going through the first chapter, I mean, there's a few outdated pieces of advice I see right away. Like checking Tumblr for leads. Checking the hashtag anime on the anime hashtag on Twitter, which is a cesspool. Checking the Crunchyroll forums, which used to be like very good and pure, but now are also a cesspool. Checking your RSS feed. Nobody has one of those anymore. And then I said, like, you could reach out to people by commenting on their blogs. I mean, we barely read blogs anymore. True. There, There's still good advice in the book. Like, um, it's good to be professional to an extent on Twitter. Like, I still get opportunities for through Twitter. That article I wrote for the Washington Post this summer, I found out about that opportunity through Twitter. <laughs> So, uh, in the in that sense, uh, so yeah, especially on Tumblr and the RSS, uh, Google Chrome eventually phased out 
the RSS up to the point the Google that Google Reader, the, yeah, I still yeah, miss Google it. Google Reader, the old readers in, and yes, yeah. Um, in Google Chrome, in most browsers, Google Chrome doesn't support RSS unless you put it on a web reader. I know, it's just, it's, it's so rare that people have RSS feeds now. Yes. I, I really miss Google Reader. Same here. It, it just, it changed everything. True. Uh, there, uh, from that alone, uh, you can read a ton of information from by by, by just adding the the RSS feed. Uh, Anime News Network, I believe, still has uh, on on the Google Reader, and uh, mm-hmm. eventually they phase it out, and then they phased out everything, and now they're uh, getting it back through the follow tab, uh, yeah, or the follow function. I believe it's coming soon on Google Chrome, uh, or maybe it's in. It's just that I don't see it because I'm using Microsoft Edge. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm using Chrome. I should check that out. Like, if you would go to even my site, otakujournalist.com slash RSS, I mean, all the it's all set up to go into an RSS reader. I just don't know anyone who looks at RSS feeds anymore. That, oh, that yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's one of the ways the internet is so different from in 2014 when I wrote this book. But, like, I mean, a majorly outdated section of the book is chapter four which is called navigating ethics and bias it features a fictional story about a video game reporter and keep in mind this is before gamergate yes i had yes. no idea how politicized it was going to become to write about games like i i wrote at kotaku and uh, as a woman it wasn't it wasn't weird I, I i imagine if i had done that in 2016 i would have faced a much more hostile environment it's like the internet's always been political, but in 2016, I think, is the breaking point where we had to all just face how extreme the internet has become. It could affect things like the elections of um, democracies. Yes. And then huge tech tech companies like Facebook basically control where we spend our attention online. And they use these big, stupid algorithms to do it. Like, have you looked through the Facebook papers? Um. I'm not yet, not yet. I haven't looked yeah. at the Facebook papers, well, but I mean, there, yeah, those. Uh, I, maybe I'll I'll take a look at that because uh, in the Philippines, Facebook offered free access to mm-hmm. mobile users. I think, and I still believe that it affected the 2016 Philippine elections big time. I, I believe it. I I think that Facebook has affected elections all over the world, and it's just the Facebook papers if have shown us like just how dumb their algorithm is like um the algorithm was weighing emojis as the most important way to gauge engagement and um they would weigh an angry face reaction emoji as five points while a like would be one point meaning that the result was that absolutely insane infuriating stuff was just splashed all over everyone's new news feeds at the slightest provocation. They realized that keeping people angry was the best way to keep people on the site. So we saw more and more angering extreme stuff, which had real life consequences. Which which reminds me that uh, this before Facebook, we talk about uh, news reporting, television news always gets the headlines, the the sad headlines, the uh, someone died or someone died in an accident or uh, something political happened, um, we, we, uh, something something like that uh, that triggers emotions, anger, uh, suspense, thrill. Uh, yes, it does keep eyeballs. Uh, glued on the TV set, so I think that makes much more sense right now. Then thank you for letting me know about uh, the basic. Uh, what what the, the, that's just a part of the Facebook papers, right? Yeah, that's just one tiny part. I mean, there's all kinds of dumb stuff in there, and it's just my book was written before I even considered navigating journalism online in this kind of environment. So how? Yeah, again, uh, it's it's really interesting to see how the internet accelerated from just a tiny small bite-sized piece of uh, fandom all the way up to a polarized uh, environment it's a polarizing environment indeed yeah like fans have always been having fights online like we're always like subs versus dubs for example in the anime community but it never got like so intense until recently like what i'm thinking about like right now is like K 
K-pop stands on ah, Twitter. Yes. They can take over an entire hashtag. They can just they can basically do DDoS attacks. They can just all organize in such a terrifying and quick way. Um, any any fandom can do this. This is just an example, and I'm not. There's nothing wrong with K-pop stands. I I I love K-pop. Yeah, but. It's, it's just an example that we've seen of like fans being able to mobilize online and really enact change, not always for the better. And um, I'm reminded of this, uh, which, which that reminds me of this uh, headline from Reading. Uh, it's in the UK, Get Reading. They released a headline sa- saying that RDG, the hashtag RDG, which stands for Reading, the place in uh, uh, London or England, uh, uh-huh. Has been hijacked by anime fans because there's this anime called Red Data Girl, RDG, yeah. yeah, and yeah. So, so that that was fascinating at most because anyone can use the hashtag, and then suddenly the official anime account steps in, uses the RDG hashtag, and all of a sudden your head your headline now in the UK tabloid, <laughs> in a local tabloid in the UK. So, uh, mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, how- yeah, and er, I, it was crazy how earlier this year, when Attack on Titan was airing, uh, like Attack on Titan was would be a, a trending hashtag every week. Um, and and then Mappa, of course, the studio itself, who's mm-hmm. doing the fourth season. Uh, there's um, yeah, it's it's really polarized at this point. There are uh, I've seen fans uh, going against Mappa. I've seen fans uh, supporting Mappa. So it's not just about the anime series anymore. It's about the studios, the voice cast. You know, um, there's 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 those kinds of things, especially when this year. I'm, I I hate to mention this, but uh, uh, if you're you're alerted with uh, about uh, about Lisa, the singer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, oh yes, her whole yeah. scandal with her yeah. husband. Yeah, that was kind of with the husband. Yeah, so, for yeah. anyone who's listening and doesn't know about it, basically. Um, her husband um, cheated with um, a young woman who worked for him, I think. Mm-hmm. And then uh, it just Lisa took off time. The husband took off time. He was involved in the free movie as like the voice of Makoto mm-hmm. and also part of a band. Uh, so mm-hmm. it delayed the entire movie. It just it just created like a huge ripple effect. Yes. I- uh, th- that meme with the small domino and eventually falling down is the big domino. Yeah, yes. Yeah. 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 It, like one guy cheats on his wife and like a bunch of anime is delayed. <laughs> it's, it's just the day that I realized that, that that movie will be delayed and the career will be stalled and uh, the guy has to take some time off. So yeah, the things the things that I don't really focus on because I'm stuck with VTubers and now uh, here we are. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, mov- yeah, moving, yeah, yeah. Even though I think of myself as mostly a stay-at-home mom lately, because mm-hmm. I, I haven't really put my daughter in daycare because I was scared for COVID. But mm-hmm. you know, I'm gonna put her in daycare next year. It's just the only way I'm really keeping up to date on all the news is through Anime News Network and putting together announcements, the newsletter. I'm pl- plugging that. Again. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. Mm-hmm. And also Twitter, right? Oh yeah, I'm always on Twitter at, yes. at Lauren in Space. Yep, yeah, always on Twitter. So moving on, given uh, that the book is close to a decade old, uh, there must be a lot of feedback on it, and I'd like to hear uh, uh, some feedbacks from your readers. Uh, well, I'm, I, I'll, I'll mention as well my feedback, uh, perhaps. So yeah, can can you tell us the feedback that you remember the most? I mean. There's not as much feedback on the book as you would expect. I'm I'm actually not sure how many people have read it. Like I could figure out how many people downloaded it. Um, but I don't want to I don't want to spend this time doing that. Let's say let's say more than a hundred people. So so there's not that much feedback. Um, like students who read it sometimes email me with like thanks, but more often they email me with follow up questions on their specific situations. Mm. Or their ideal reporting topics. Like, it's like, I want to become this kind of reporter. What kind of advice do you have for me specifically? Or, um, like we've said, this is kind of an outdated book now, you know, happening before Gamergate, before the politis- the, the Facebookization of the internet, I'm going to say. Mm-hmm. So um, people ask, ask me questions and ask for advice. And then um, I like to try to answer it on the blog. 
I um, have not written on the blog lately, though. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, maybe uh, in the next uh, few months or so, maybe we can... Uh, well, well I, I was I was already daydreaming of a sequel to that, but it's it's your call to uh, pursue that uh, pursue a sequel for the book. Uh, but yeah, let's uh, we shall move on to the yeah maybe an updated version sometime. Yeah, yeah, an, an updated version. I, I I would like to help. <laughs> well, thank you. All right, that's a very generous offer. All right. Okay. Um, you have uh, mentioned, uh, I, I think this is related to the question earlier. You have mentioned quite a lot of names in the book who fit your definition of otaku journalist or otaku journalism in general. Have you seen more of them over time? Oh, yes. More than ever. I think I la named like five people in the book, like my friend Asia Romano, who is like one of the first fandom journalists that I even knew of. Um, what I call otaku journalism in my book is what I'd think of increasingly um, as this just more and more common type of fan culture reporting. And I feel like there's this whole new generation of culture reporters who write about niche fandom things for a general audience. Um, when Just brainstorming about it, I was thinking of Stitch, who writes for Teen Vogue, of all places, about racism in fandom. Mm. Uh, I was thinking of Palmer Hash, who writes about memes uh, for Insider. And uh, I'm very familiar with E.J. Dixon, who writes for Rolling Stone about the absolute weirdest online drama, like uh, Gamer Girl Bathwater and cosplay killings and what bronies are up to now. And um, I'm particularly aware of these because these are all articles she's used me as an expert source for. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I do like I, I am quoted in those like giving advice about fandom or like giving suggestions not suggestions, but just like giving background about what the heck a, a Sundere is or um, what a Hago is. Just things that like the general audience for Rolling Stone might not know. And what's interesting is that a general audience that reads Rolling Stone would be interested in these kind of very fringe subculture things. I, I don't necessarily think it's that there's that many more fans of these things, but that um, all kinds of people have an appetite for learning about these new com these communities. So I, th I think it's very interesting that you can write about something like cosplay for the Washington Post, like I did. And part of that story was me explaining cosplay 101, because some of the people who were reading this may have never heard of cosplay before, and yet they were still interested in it. There's just like this more open and accepting trend on the part of um, mainstream news to cover this stuff. I think that's also related to um, the internet becoming more mainstream, uh, probably because of the pandemic, keeping everyone at home, spending all of our lives online. We realize, OK, the internet is real life. What happens here is real and impacts real life. So people are more interested in like these niche internet happenings which which makes sense because uh especially at these times you know um in, in in my end of the in my neck of the woods we always have cosplay drama drama between cosplayers uh unfulfilled the uh, you know, unfulfilled uh, tasks and all that. Uh, so sometimes with uh, mm -hmm. those those cosplayers who also accept commissions, or artists who got uh, traced, or communities who have been tagged as, uh, with uh, by some people as uh, someone uh, someone or something that keeps art tracers in. Yeah, it's it's uh, th those things are ca quite complicated to say in a few a few words, but yeah. Um, especially at this time, you mentioned the Facebookization of the internet at the time where information, misinformation, and disinformation even tread the anime communities. Especially that uh, after 2015, it's already the post truth era. Just how important are the role of us otaku journalists? I love this question. I'm I'm so glad you asked this one because I just feel like misinformation is so prevalent. Even in, like, the anime and manga communities, that, that I fall for it. Like, all the time, I have to take a step back and be like, wait a minute. <laughs> because 
I, I think the thing is, these big stories, these fake stories are counting on us to have a big emotional reaction before we even realize if it makes sense. If we even think, before we even think, huh, is this really true? We have to be so worked up about it that we share it anyway. Yes. Uh, like an example is, um, okay, so there was this blog that specializes in writing fake parody articles. Yes. And they reported that the new Netflix Cowboy Bebop adaptation was going to have Ein played by a husky instead of a corgi. <laughs> <laughs> now, doesn't that just piss you off? <laughs> Like, it's like, oh, come on, Netflix. You couldn't even use the right dog. Like, you don't even care if it's real before you share that. It's like we all just, like, made up a guy to get mad at. And it's like Netflix has made some, uh, like, missteps in the past. So it's like, yeah, that's plausible. You don't even look into it. And you're like, yeah, I'm so mad. And uh, I just... Yeah, so so at first I was like, oh, that's awful. And then I was like, wait a minute, is that true? Yeah, what is the and website? Sh- yeah, yeah. So, first things first. What is the website and is this good to be too good to be true? <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's like it's like wait a minute. Who's reporting this? How many people are reporting this? Um what are their sources? Does it say in the bottom of the site, "Oh, this is a parody site" because sometimes it just does. And yeah, I feel particularly guilty when I fall for this stuff and I do my best to do like a follow up tweet to explain what the actual truth is, because I think that's my job as somebody who practices journalism, who went to grad school for journalism and and knows better. I think part of what a degree in journalism is, is a degree in Internet literacy. But I think we're all navigating Internet literacy all the time because the Internet is changing and becoming more extreme and more polarizing all the time. And it's counting on these big emotional reactions. So we really have to stay level-headed and think, is this true before we share stuff? Definitely. Um, Internet has become a part of our lives that it perhaps can be a basic human right all along. And then it gets polarizing at the same time. So it's, it's a wild ride, to say at the least. And... Yeah, thank you for answering that question because uh, especially these times... That's a great question. Especially these times when they say uh, No Game No Life will have a second season. What? Is this true? Is this too good to be true? Did, did uh-huh. the anime announce this? Something like that. So it's it's really important for people who can provide the proper context. It's, it's I think it's all about context. Do you agree? It's all, it's all about context. Yeah, and it's about um, really just stopping and thinking. Like... Be, be thinking with your head instead of your heart because it's like you want this to be true but is it true <laughs> is it true true or enough true mm-hmm. is it is it glass half full or half empty those just, those kinds of things is it true or do i just want it to be true that especially that or do we have it uh yeah i think i think that that goes well with some people that i know in the community although they don't they do not write but they still have these uh uh for for a lack of a better word delusions of grandeur to think about stuff like we have in the television broadcast scene here in the philippines uh we think about anime uh what if uh this tv network will air anime and all of a sudden as uh, uh i think there's this one tv station uh, if you're familiar with abs cbn it's disenfranchised as a network but they uh, mm-hmm. they got uh, they got the block timer to tag uh they they, they bought block time to, for um another channel uh, and that they, they, I think they're starting to air anime uh, gradually. The, the usual ones that they have in the archive, though. And uh, this is another major network. Uh, it's called TV5 here, uh, different from the TV5 in France. Uh, they started airing My Hero Academia in uh, Filipino dubbing. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, th- those are those are two interest, interesting developments. Although most of the time in the Philippines, when you talk about anime news, there's uh, rare. There's rare chances, except if there's a movie that's a uh, that's available in the Philippines, or uh, uh, yeah, we have we have our own set of distributors here, and we're lucky to have our own set of distributors here. You guys there have Funimation all along, or G Kids, yeah, or yeah, yeah. I'm very grateful. You know, you should write about this for Anime News Network, and then maybe I'll feature it in the newsletter. It's just like recently we had somebody from. Um, 
some Brazil from Brazil, right about like the anime fandom scene in Brazil. Wouldn't it be cool to have one on the anime fandom scene in the Philippines? Because right. um, anime news network readers, well, anime news network is based in Canada, so it would be interesting to them. Okay, uh, maybe I'll pitch that. I'll pitch that one. Yeah, do All it. Right, do it. Let this podcast be the record that you be a be a record that you said you would do it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, uh, since uh, we're talking about that, uh, following from the previous question, let's, let's talk about this one. Gatekeeping is present mm. in all communities. When, uh, for example, again, the No Game, No Life fandom, I'd like to put that as an example because I, I sometimes get fooled that there will be a, a season two of that. I love the series and I really love it. Uh, they already had a movie. They already had an anime. They're still continuing the manga. I believe they'll have an announcement soon. But uh, season two, uh, that's, that's not yet in the radar yet. It's still being discussed among the fans. So uh, another example will be the Attack on Titan fandom. When, uh, when say, uh, culture reporters talk about Attack on Titan from their perspective. Or more importantly, game reporters, especially with Gamergate. There's gatekeeping. Gatekeeping is present in all communities. So, so I suppose, um, uh, to, to I suppose, uh, its, it's uh, goal is to ward off any outsiders who may pose as risks in the fandom. Um, um, another example that I have is that the VTubers from Hololive uh, mm -hmm. will be uh, allowed to stream, uh, say, Final Fantasy, the uh, online game, not uh, not the actual the console game, but the online game. And uh, I've seen already some people on Twitter gate uh, tr uh, trying to gatekeep this stuff and are concerned that, that uh, once the, the stream starts and the, they play on stream that people will get interested in Final Fantasy on the downside uh, they will there will be more people crowding in the game so uh, that could be a risk to them and so they they decide to gatekeep on that that's how I see it from your perspective does this help us otaku journalists to cover the situation gatekeeping I mean, usually I'd say gatekeeping is not great. It's something we want to keep out of our communities. But I think you also hit the nail on the head about why it can happen sometimes. I mean, because people, maybe people have been burned by misinformation and they think, oh, you don't really, we're keeping you out of the community because we don't think you really know what's what. Um, like, I recently saw an example of gatekeeping, which was, um, well, you know, because of the supply chain, everything it's been really hard to get Gumpla lately, you know, the plastic models. Ah, uh, yes. Um, uh, based on the Gundam anime. Um, so there was there are some manufacturers that are only selling to people who can correctly pronounce the names of the kit. Um, the Gundam uh, High New New um, looks like the letter V in English. So some people who don't who aren't familiar with Gundam might be calling it the High V. And they're like, okay, if that's how you pronounce it, we're not going to sell it to you. Mm -hmm. Which I, I just think is very funny, but it's a type of ga gatekeeping that has come out of necessity just to try to uh, try to make sure that it's fans who get access to these kits rather than um, people who they see as outsiders. But of course, there's going to be some fans who, like, I don't know, maybe they don't they haven't watched um, Char's Counterattack yet, so they didn't know how to pronounce it. I mean, they're going to get left out. Yes, and I think um, this, the purpose here is for uh -huh. uh, to get to get rid of scalpers who are selling it at a higher price and raking off other people's money. Yes, but yeah. yes, uh, yeah, that's another perspective. That yeah, we basically, look like I can see why gatekeeping happens, but I don't see it as something that helps or hurts journalists. I, I see it as a problem that journalists should try to work to uh, resolve. Like, if people are are gatekeeping because um, they want to keep misinformation out of the community. That's something that uh, journalists can um, help with by continuing to reinforce what the truth is, to back it up with facts, to do some um, reporting and, and, and be able to prove or, or disprove an allegation. Yes, definitely. So I, th I think I, I rem uh, what I remember most about facts when you say the word facts is Ben Shapiro saying facts don't care about your feelings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
So um, regardless of uh, political inclinations, I think that that resonates to me the most. So proper context is really a key to me. So I always um, some, I oftentimes mention context, especially on Twitter. I tweet and all that. And uh, as I write also for Anime Corner uh, uh, about VTubers and stuff, uh, we, we have a an upcoming update from a VTuber agency in Malaysia uh coming up uh, on the site uh, as well as of this recording so yeah context is key and yeah uh gatekeeping to me is uh to me it's just a, it's a necessity for us to explore or delve the word because if we dive in straight and uh, you know sometimes um we report things differently the way it's not supposed to be as perceived by the gatekeepers the fandom so they 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 do gatekeep on that stuff it's it's i think it's a matter of trust i think it's a matter of immersion like i believe you've immersed yourself in a maid cafe before right one one moment oh yes that was uh like back in uh uh like 2011 that was a long time ago that I went to the Katsukon Maid Cafe and then reported from the perspective of a maid. So I guess I guess uh, when you say fans make great reporters, you really mean it. It's it's immersion at its best. So I, I, I um, while I vaguely remember the story itself, what I remember the most is that you immersed yourself in that space, and that is the uh, perhaps the majority basis. The, the ma- yeah, the basis for the report. And yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's the main takeaway from the book, really. Fans make great reporters. So, uh, speaking of that, does this idea, does that idea of autopo uh, journalism stand still up to this day? Fans make great reporters. I mean, yeah, I've been thinking about this, and the, the, I'm, the, answer, the short answer is yes, but the long answer is that is not the whole story. I do think um, fandom is a great place to start a um, beat from, but it's it's not everything you need. I mean, you need to have an understanding of ethics. You need to be good at pitching to editors. You need to be good at writing. And um, just having passion for your fandom isn't enough. You also need to be able to look at things from other people's perspectives. What I like about... Um, fan reporters starting from a place of fandom is that you're not starting from a place of looking at um, these niche communities and subcultures as an other. These stories used to be written as like, oh, look at those weirdos over there. And when fans started, um, you know, taking control and writing about their own communities, there was a much more neutral or um, kinder tone about about these um, communities, which is great because a lot of people who are in the communities are the ones reading these pieces. All right, so basically, it's a great place to start, but it it isn't everything. You still need to have like professional journalism skills. And speaking about uh, journalism, uh, here's a bonus question that I sent in. The mm-hmm. 2021 Nobel Peace Prize is awarded to journalists Maria Ressa and Dmitry Muratov, and journalists were given the Nobel Peace Prize for the first time after Karl von Ossietsky is awarded the accolade in 1935. This is a long time ago. Is it uh, around 90 years? Yeah, 90 years, I, I think. Around 90 years or almost 90 years. What does this mean to you as a journalist? 86 years. 86 years. Thank you. I just, I just did a cal- get on the calculator. So what does that mean to you as a journalist? Okay, the Nobel Peace Prize in journalism. So, um, I mean, these reporters are in an entirely different league. I definitely do not consider myself to be an equal with the kind of journalists who are risking their lives to report on our freedoms, to expose wrongdoing among politicians and billionaires. I mean, that kind of thing. (laughs) I mean, from what I've read about the 2021 winners, they absolutely deserve this prize. But um, I I mean, I feel like there are many more differences in what they do and what I do than similarities. I guess the similarities would be that um, we follow um, a a similar code of um, ethics and um, try to limit our bias. 
Um, we probably have similar education in journalism, but our experiences are totally different. I wouldn't say that um, anything I'm doing is worthy of a Nobel Peace Prize or really. It's just subculture reporting at the end of the day, it's to entertain people. It's to inform them about um, that the fact that these fringe communities exist if they're not in them or to catch them up on like drama or interesting developments in the, in these communities, but it's not really um, a life or death situation very rarely. But um, yeah, so, so <laughs> I don't know. Maybe we should have some very low stakes prize for subculture reporting. Maybe there already is one, but definitely the Nobel Peace Prize is, uh, and the the people who win it, very deserving. Just feel like it's a completely different job. I see. So when, while uh, maybe we have uh, different perspectives in how they did this, uh, but uh, the 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 story still sticks, and it stands still that they are awarded the peace prize despite all of these things that are happening despite of uh, despite their situation especially yeah, with how, um yeah i was wondering how do you feel as someone living in the philippines about how they uh won for their um you know their reporting about freedom of expression in the philippines so in my perspective um just to disclaim i also interned at rappler for the last part of my internship. So I got experience from government radio, from uh, broadsheet, and then from Rappler. So that's why I, when I, uh, at the first time I see Maria Ressa in person, she's spontaneous, yes. Oh, that's fantastic. You met but her. I, yes. And uh, I'm, I'm happy that I met her. Prior to my internship at Rappler, I've attended a, a social good summit before. <clears throat> but uh, in, nowadays, we're talking of a different landscape. The, the, the readers are hostile. Most of them are supporters of the government, and they knew they do not believe in what Rapper reports. So it's difficult. It's Maria Ress is in a difficult situation, and they are perceived as biased. Although they are part of Facebook's uh, initiative to combat the uh, fake news, fake information. So again, it's a different. They're perceived landscape. as biased, but they won the Nobel Peace Prize. That yeah, is right? interesting. It's like nobody can escape it. I was just telling you, like these guys are in a different league. They are a super professional, and yet they are facing the same like accusations of bias as journalists all over who report on all kinds of things. Yes, especially in the political beat, it gets really political. It's polarizing here. In, uh, yeah, um, you, there, there was this one time that our vice president, Lenny Robredo, reported about uh, the situation of the extrajudicial killings, the war on drugs in the Philippines. Those things are really touchy. Those things are really dangerous to touch, for that matter, because it's, it's all a matter of uh, writing. Oh, sure, you finish writing the story, but then again, the people may perceive uh, things differently. Like it could be perceived as biased or against the government. Therefore, you're not uh, with us. Uh, it's it's like in the dictator. It, you're you ain't us. Uh, you hate us because you ain't us. Something like that, or or some uh, or it could be a different perspective. Like um, you, uh, you 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 refuse to see the reality that's in. Sometimes it gets delusional. Uh, but not but not all Filipinos. Uh, are like that. So thankfully, yeah, we mean, still have a community. Not all of anyone is. Yes. Not all of any group is like that. Yes. Thankfully, we still have open-minded people uh, who are weighing in, still weighing in. It still takes time to weigh in on the matters that uh, our reporters are writing about the stuff that's going on, especially as and, and especially this time, uh, Facebook's platform supports sponsored ads containing phishing. Mm-hmm. So we we while we have Facebook accounts, we 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 tend to hate on Facebook as a platform, especially that uh, I believe there's this news that uh, Mark Zuckerberg is going to uh, name his uh, platform differently. Like we have Facebook the app, Facebook the company, and then uh, Facebook the company will be probably most probably renamed to something different. 
because you, you can't distinguish Facebook the app from Facebook the company. So uh, one tweet I posted uh, posted uh, earlier is like just just call it Zuck. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah, just call it Zuck because we live in a Zuck world. We live in a world where uh, virtual reality exists thanks to Oculus, and it's also a, a Facebook platform. Part I of mean, the, yeah. Facebook didn't make Oculus; they just yeah, bought they it. Yeah, they bought it. Yes, but it's it's part of the Facebook platform. So Oculus, yeah. WhatsApp, Instagram, Facebook Messenger, and yeah, that's that's the ecosystem. And also React JS. Mm-hmm. That's also Facebook. So we live in a Zuck world where everything, yeah. where JavaScript is Zuck, where our Instagram is Zuck. <laughs> Why not call I it wish Zuck? I, could, <laughs> I wish I could delete my account, but it's just... It's just too big. Oh, it's like, how would I sell anything again? I use Facebook yeah. Marketplace and my, like, my condo community is on there. It's just, it affects my day-to-day life. It's, it's really intertwined, uh, to say at the least. So... Yeah, I think uh, we've uh, went, uh, we went to all of the questions that uh, we have at the uh, at this point. And again, Lauren, thank you, thank you so much for sharing your time with us. It's it's a really fun conversation. While I'm having some, you know, the 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 stage fright uh, moments of stage fright on my end, it's I'm, I'm really proud that I am able to talk with one of my inspirations, really. That is so sweet of you to say. Thank you, Jay. <laughs> just, I feel like I've been really in hibernation this year. I've been mostly parenting, and I'm so happy to know that things that I've written like a few years back can still have an impact on people. Yes, and uh, speaking of my feedback about the book, I love it when you humanize the sto- the, the book with its stories, even though it's fictional, even though it has... Uh, uh, it it does it does have a sentimental value to you. And they all have a grain of truth, yeah. Yeah, sentimental value as well. And you know that the, the point here is to uh, I, the, the, I I believe the goal here is for you to inspire us to uh, put our first foot forward, uh, take the first step in niche reporting and doing this. So again, I really appreciate the time that uh, you, you you have with us on this episode thank you thank you very much so thank you jay i'm so glad that i had a chance to talk about this book and reflect on it seven years later seven years later so speaking of uh, we'll go back to the book uh, you mentioned you have a five-day promotion on amazon at this point so uh yep. by by this time when- they uh, most of the uh, viewers and listeners will be able to uh listen to this or watch this on youtube by the tw- uh, by the 5th of november and by that time, you should go check Amazon right now and see the free promotion of Otaku Journalism, the book. That's Otaku Journalism, a guide to geek reporting on in the digital age by Lauren Ursini. And That's right. you can also yeah, you can also check out her other books. Like uh, Build Your Anime Blog, the cosplay book for a uh, cartoon books. Yep. And um, yeah, the Raspberry Pi book, but uh, <laughs> yeah. that one doesn't really fit my brand. Yeah, but um, thank you so much once again, Jay. And I hope, um, e- even though this book is old, I hope people still get some enjoyment out of it. It was really a labor of love. Really appreciate that. Do you have uh, where where can we find you? By the way, um, most of the time you can find me on Twitter at Lauren in Space, and uh, I mean you can also sign up for the Anime News Network newsletter. I curate that every week. All right. So on my end, you can find this episode and other past episodes on youtube.com slash jayagonoy, anchor.fm slash keepsakes. And uh, I also write occasionally on the blog, jayagonoy.xyz. That is it for us. And again, with Lauren Orsini, our guest, really appreciate it. Uh, my name is Jayagonoy, and this has been Keepsakes, the podcast. See you next episode. Bye.